Turn us loose. <laughs> okay. Or I get to some more good stuff. <clears throat> We're going to uh, introduce our teacher, which is uh, Katrina McPherson. You get her to come out here. There we go. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I don't know Katrina as well as I'd like to. Oh, and before I do that, I got to let everybody know that. I hear her parents are kind of shy, so I'm not going to make them stand up. They're already standing. With oh, that's else. right. They're standing with their back. <laughs> I'm not going to point them out to you. you. You're going to have to introduce yourself, okay? But her mom and dad are here, and uh, Casey's mom is here, too. So anyway, yeah, they're already standing up. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> that was great. Okay. Um, but I see what a witness she is to her husband as far as a help me to Casey. I've been able to observe. I see what a faithful servant she is because she's in that room, hidden, um, so that we all can have this fellowship and that you all, live streamers, can join in with us. If it wasn't for Casey and Brennan, Brendan, and <laughs> did I get it right? Thank you. And then uh, Michael, Sienna, Joanna, Katrina, but you don't see them. You don't know sometimes what's going on and who's in the backbone of the work of what's going on here. Well, this lady is one of them. Okay, and so, and she signs beautifully, if you haven't seen that. And whenever I've asked her to do, join the dance team and sign, she's never said no. She's like, I won't do that. She's never done that. She's like, yeah, okay. She's a willing servant with a willing servant's heart. And I am just blessed beyond measure I mean, elated that you get to hear her this morning. So before I do that, Mike, will you come up here? I want to, I want to say a prayer with her. We're going to pray over her. Okay. Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we commit this woman to you for the word that she has to share this morning. We thank you for the Holy Spirit at work in her. We thank you, Lord Jesus, how you work in her heart. We thank you, Lord, that you guide and direct her steps and that you will help her be able to, to communicate the heart of what she wants to communicate, which is your heart and the, your father's heart in this category and this friendship that she's going to be teaching us. Father, we left to, her to you. We are so very thankful for her life. And Father, I'm just so thankful for all the young people here at this church. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, for just being able to see the gold that you're mining from them. It's, it's awesome. And our little ones downstairs, that's the next generation, two generations. I'm not quite sure how it is. But I'd love to be, live long enough to see them too and the, mine, the gold that you're going to mine from them. But this is a gold mine here. And Lord, today we're mining her. And you are actually. And we praise you and thank you for her in our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have fun as you guys take me out of my comfort zone. Okay. <laughs> um, go ahead, sit down. Don't make me any more nervous. <laughs> um, wow, this morning has just been full of just worship with family, whether you're here at CFF or you're joining us on the live stream. Um, something this morning has already touched your lives, and it's going to continue to touch your lives, and that's just been my hope ever since um, Tanya had asked me a couple months ago to share, and I don't take that lightly um, to be able to stand up here today and share what God's put on my heart uh, for you guys. Um, I kept, I did teach this at camp, as Marty said, and I was like, when Tanya asked me to teach, I was like, okay, what do you got? What do you got for your people? Um, is it something I've already done? Is it something new? And I'm like, okay, I'm just going to start free writing notes on a bunch of different topics. But every time I would start something on worship or love or family, he kept bringing me back to this. And I was like, all right, I give up. I heed your, I get it. I get it. This is what I'm supposed to talk about. <laughs> 
So uh, the music this morning, when I asked Marty to lead for me, I was like, all right, the music and the worship is totally up to you. You have, trust God, he's gonna tell you what to play, and everything has fit perfectly um, with the message that God's put on my heart for you guys. And whether you're listening on the live stream, listening to it online later, or whether you're here this morning, this topic is for you, and it's about friends and friendship. We all struggle as people, as humans, to find that connection with somebody, to find that emotional, spiritual, just a shoulder to cry on when you need a good cry. Uh, And God's wanted that from us since the beginning, since the garden. Brendan, if you could pull up the first verse for me. Um, I'm not super heavy on scripture, but I do have a few, so we're gonna hit those when we can and they'll be up on the screen. Um, Every verse I'm gonna read from today is from the KJV, um, but if another translation speaks to you, run with it. God speaks to us in many, many different ways. But Genesis 2.18, And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make for him a helpmate. And God did for Adam and Eve. But he gave us something even better than a helpmate, than an actual person. He gave us the greatest friend of all time. Proverbs 18, 24 talks about that a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But the next part is, there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. We all have that friend that we say is a friend, but they're closer to us than that. We call them a sister, a brother, somebody that you lay your life on the line for every day. We got that and the best big brother that there could ever be, Jesus Christ. The friend that shows himself friendly every day. He's there when you need him. He's there when you want to be alone. He's that shoulder to cry on. He's that pat on the back to keep you going at night when all you want to do is throw up your hands, give up, and go home. He'll be there for you regardless of what is going on in your lives. The greatest friend will do whatever it takes to show you that he loves you, that he cares for you, and that he's got your back. Verses throughout the Bible talk about God's character and the character of his son. And I could spend the rest of the afternoon going through each and every verse with you, talking about the promises of God that he's given us in our friend Jesus Christ, that he's given us in himself, and that we can claim as Christians, that we can cling to every day knowing that we have the power inside of us. Hebrews 13, 15. Sorry, 13, 5. I got ahead of myself. (laughs) Let your conversation be without covetousness. We all have that little green-eyed monster that sits on our shoulders when we see something that somebody else has, and we want it. And we're already friends with them, so we're like, do I ruin a friendship by wanting what they have? Or do I put it aside and focus on the good? Focus on what I already have with this person, this relationship that I have. Be content with such things as you have. God's blessed you immensely in your lives. The fact that you all opened your eyes this morning and are sitting here is a blessing from God. 
I was challenged a couple years ago at a teen camp to, at the end of the night, before we laid our heads down, we were challenged by the speaker, write down the blessings of God from the last 24 hours. Because we don't usually think about the small things. We recognize the big blessings. God gave me, you know, he got me out of this debt. God got me out of a bad situation. God got me a new house. God got me a new car. Those are the big blessings. We focus on those. But what about the everyday blessings? Thank you, God, for letting me wake up this morning. Thank you for letting me walk. Thank you for the food on my table, for the clothes on my back. The little blessings are the ones that we forget, but they're the ones that we should remember the most. Be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Probably my favorite promise in the Bible from God is in this verse. You never have to feel alone. And that is something that I have struggled with for years. I could be in a crowded room full of 100 people and still feel alone. but I'm never alone. My big brother's standing right beside me. But not only is he beside me, he's inside me. And he's got my back. And he's got yours too. John 8, 15, another promise of God. You judge after the flesh. I can hear my grandma. She used to always have these funny little sayings, saying for everything. Every time I saw her, she had a new one. Don't ever judge a book by its cover. I'm sure we've all heard that one. But we do. The second you walk into it, somebody walks into your line of sight, immediately you start judging. but God's not judging you. And Jesus Christ isn't judging you either. They don't care about your past. They don't care about your present. And they don't care about your future. They care about what's inside you and what you can become and what you will become through them. It's so easy for us to get hung up on something that's happened or worry about something that will happen. And, and who knows even if it will. Focus on the here and now. Be in the moment with your best friend, the greatest friend. And the future and the past, they're gonna be like dust in the wind. They're not gonna matter because they've already been taken care of. Jesus Christ doesn't judge us. He's never pro said that he will judge us. He just wants what you've already given him. And if you haven't given it to him, he's still waiting. But he's not judging you for not giving him your heart. But he's waiting. And as soon as you take that step, your life's gonna change. And the best friend in the history of the world has your back, and he has your sister's back, and he's got your brother's back, he's got everybody's back. The next verse I want to look at is John 15, 5. Being a part of something that's bigger than you can sometimes be hard to wrap your head around. And getting, but the enemy likes to attack us when we're at our lowest point, when we're feeling alone, when we don't know where to go, and we feel defeated. That's when the enemy strikes. 
But John 15, five says, I am the vine and ye are the branches. Abideth in me and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. The enemy likes us to get hung up on that nothing. He wants us to feel like we're nothing. He wants us to think we can do nothing. And he wants us to be nothing. But go back to the beginning. We are the branches in the truest vine that there has ever been. He's got our back. So when the enemy comes and the enemy attacks you, look him in the eye and tell him to get behind you because that's where he belongs. Behind you and under your feet because your brother has already won that victory and we can win that same victory because he's with us. The greatest friend is going to help us overcome that victory. The kingdom looks to the future. We look to the promises ahead. And sometimes they seem like they're insurmountable because the enemy likes us to think that there's a mountain we coming that we can't climb. But again, with Jesus inside us and beside us, that mountain, it's an anthill. Just step right over it, or on it, however you're feeling. <laughs> the verses of the Bible that show God's character, they're cover to cover. And we have all of that inside of us because we're a part of the biggest family that's ever lived, that's ever existed. We only get to see a small portion of it. And you live streamers, you see the portion of it that's in your community. But where two or three are gathered together, there's a fourth, there's a fifth. Add one more to your group because you got Jesus beside you. He's never going to leave you alone. Believe me, he'll never leave you alone. <laughs> um, it's amazing sometimes how God talks to us, whether it's through his word, whether it's through a prayer or a prophecy or another manifestation of the spirit, which we heard beautifully this morning, and each one conveyed the message that God had. God doesn't speak to any one person alone in any one way. And for a while, I used to believe the only way God was going to speak to me was if I got myself in his word and I got myself on my knees in prayer. Well, he still does. I'm not saying that he won't. But there's other ways that God can speak to you. And one way that he speaks to me is through music, through song and worship. And Marty, the music you chose this morning was phenomenal. It flowed immensely with the message that we have. Um, but don't ignore when God is speaking to you, even if it's in a way that he's never spoken to you before. Because maybe it's a verse, it's a song, it's a teaching that you've heard 10 times before. Maybe he's speaking to you in a different way. Maybe before you focused solely on, you know, you were audible. You've, what is the word saying? What is the teacher saying? What is, you know, the song saying? Maybe this time he's got a vision for you. Or maybe this time he's got oh, just one word 
but he wrote it down. God's going to speak to you, and he's going to give you something new every single day. Um, I do want to play a song real quick. It goes with the teaching. It flows with the message that we've had today. Um, But while it's playing, don't just listen to the words. Don't just watch the video. Picture yourself with your best friend, with Jesus, and see if he's got a new word for you. See if there's something that he wants to give you this morning outside of what I'm saying up here. Um, The song is called You Will Be Found, and this uh, version of it is by the One Voice Children's Choir. Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear? Like you could fall and no one would hear? that lonely feeling wash away maybe there's a reason to believe you'll be okay cause when you don't feel strong enough to stand you can reach reach out your hand and oh someone will come running and I know comes crashing through when you need a friend to carry you when you're broken on the ground you will be found so let the sun come streaming in cause you'll reach up and rise again lift your head and look around you will be found Crashing through when you need someone to carry you 
found when you're at your lowest low even when you're at your highest high you will be found at the right time in the right place God's got somebody he's going to bring into your life it's no accident they filmed that in a vineyard we talked about it already. We are the branches of the vine. But we've looked at the best friend that we have in our Savior, and our big brother. But he's not the only friend we've got. And again, the Bible is filled with examples when God brings a friend into your life at the right time, at the right place, and in the right setting. But I want to focus on one pair, friends, this morning. And I want to focus on David and Jonathan. We all know about David, the shepherd boy who was anointed king by Samuel the prophet, who slayed the giant, who wrote most of the book of Psalms, praising God. Jonathan the son of Saul, first king of Israel. You would think these two would do nothing but butt heads. <laughs> they should be enemies. They became the surest friends. Um, there are, I'm going to talk about their entire story, and I want to focus on a few verses of their life together. Um, Brennan, go ahead and pull up 1 Samuel 18. We'll start in verse 1. After David's been anointed king by Samuel, it wasn't immediate. He was going to have to wait. Saul was already king. David goes home. He takes about his day. He keeps tending his father's sheep. One day, dad's like, hey, your brothers are at war. Go check on them. Take them some food. See what they need. Turns out, God had other plans than just checking in on his brothers. He slayed Goliath with a rock, a sling, and ironically, Goliath's own sword, which is a whole message in of itself, and I won't get into that. Um, <laughs> but after all of that happens, Saul calls David to Jerusalem, to the palace. And this is where David and Jonathan's story begins. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking to Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him go no more home to his father's house. Uh, right there, you get called to probably the person who's supposed to be your worst enemy. And he says, yeah, you're going to live here. You're not going home anymore. David's a teenager. He wants nothing more than to be back home with his family. So I'm sure at this point he's looking for a friend. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David. And his garments, even his sword and his bow, and to his girdle. They just met probably not 10 minutes before, we don't know how the time passed, 
but immediately their friendship sparked. And Jonathan literally took the coat off his back and gave it to David. I love you, man. And Jonathan was there for David for the rest of his life. If you read on in 1 Samuel, a spirit comes upon Saul. And he gets angry. And he gets frustrated. So David comes, and he tries to soothe Saul. He plays the harp. And Saul says, nope. I want to kill him. Three times, Saul tries to kill David. Three times, Jonathan defends his friend from his own father. And Jonathan finally says to David, look, I don't know what's going on with my dad, but he's out to get you. Run. We're not going to see each other again. I love you. Run. Save yourself. Fast forward. Saul and Jonathan are killed by the Philistines. David loses his best friend. Once David is finally crowned king, he remembers Jonathan. And he's like, how can I repay him? How can I show Jonathan the love of God that he showed to me at my lowest point? 2 Samuel 9, we'll start in verse 3 and then jump down to verse 6. And the king said, this is David, is there not yet any of the house of Saul? It didn't even have to be somebody from Jonathan's line. It could have been anybody. Is there any yet of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. God had a different plan in store. He was going to bless Jonathan, even though Jonathan wasn't around to receive the blessing. Now, when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, you can only, let's pause right here, you can only imagine what is going through Mephibosheth's mind when the king calls you. Knowing the history between your families, you got to think it can't be good. At least that's what I would be thinking. He fell on his face in reverence. He's like, I'm just going to assume the worst. I'm just going to go in, throw myself at the king, and hope for the best. And David said to Mephibosheth, hey, Look at me. And he answered and said, Behold thy servant. I'll do whatever you want, just don't kill me. It's probably what's going through his head. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore unto you all of the land of Saul and you shall continually eat bread at my table. That's a 180 twist from what my pivot chef was thinking was going to happen. He's thinking he's going to be there and get punished for what his grandfather did. Instead, he gets blessed for what his father did. David gives him back his family's land, which he had every right to keep. And he does one better. He takes care of Jonathan's son for the rest of his life. I look at the friendship of Jonathan and David, and another one of my grandma's sayings goes through my head. Make new friends, but keep the old. 
One is silver and the other is gold. Jonathan and David were old friends. They were as gold as gold could be to each other. But let's not forget, there was a 13-year span where they didn't see each other while David was on the run. David wasn't alone. David was in hiding with 37 men. The Bible calls them mighty warriors. I'll guarantee you something this, David called each and every one of them a friend. Silver. There are countless other examples that I could look at in the Bible of friends that had impacts on each other's lives. Um, Peter and John, Timothy and Paul, Abraham and Lot. The Bible is filled with countless examples of friends that have come into people's lives at the right time because of how God orchestrated that timing. But the next verse in Proverbs 27, 17 shows us that sometimes we do have, for lack of a better term, to put our guard up. Iron sharpeneth iron. For any of you hunters or toolsmen out there, you know how to sharpen a knife. You sharpen it against another piece of iron. But you have to sharpen it the right way. Otherwise, you got a dull knife, it ain't gonna do anything. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friends. Your friends will have an impact on your life. Is the impact good? Is it pressing towards kingdom? Or is it for the world? Does the enemy have control? I'm not here to tell you who to be friends with. God knows what you need. He knows who you need. He knows when you need them. Jesus, the best friend we have, continually sharpens our countenance daily, pressing towards kingdom. Are you doing the same for the friends in your life? For the people that you interact with on a daily basis? Are you helping them press towards kingdom? Or not? That's between you, Jesus, and your friends. My grandma had another saying, which is applicable to this verse. It's going to maybe disconnect. You are what you eat. Same can be said for your friends. They impact you more than you realize. Perfect example was Abraham's nephew, Lot. I won't turn to the verses. I won't go through the whole story. But Lot and Abraham separate. Abraham goes one way. Lot goes towards Sodom and Gomorrah. Because he's like, they've got it good over there. The grass is greener on the other side. He's like, I'm not going to stay in the city. I'll stay outside the city. They're there if I need protection or if I need food or if I need something. They're, it's right there. I'll stay on the outside, though. A couple years later... Lot is sitting at the gates. He's part of the city. I'll guarantee you he had friends in that community that impacted the decisions that led him there. The last verse I want to look at, and I want to spend some time in this one, is John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I've said it before, and I'll probably say it a hundred more times. Our greatest friend already did this. He literally laid down his life for us on the cross. The greatest act of love that has ever been shown on this earth 
was on the cross when Jesus paid it all, when he showed us the true meaning of friendship. But now, let's twist this on our heads, on its head. Let's make it personal. Take out that word life and replace it with what has become your life. Is it a job? Is it a sports team? A video game? A cell phone? Social media? You fill in the blank. What has become your life? Would you lay it down for somebody if God asked you to? If your best friend in the world knocked on your door this afternoon and said, I need you, would you lay it down for them? I can tell you in my own life it would be hard. It would be hard. Sacrifices would be made. But to be Jesus to somebody, that's what it's going to take. Lay down your life for your friends. Show them the love that has already been shown to you from your brother, your savior, and from your father. All relationships take work, not just our friends, husbands and wives, parents to children, bosses to employees. You fill in the relationship that's happening in your life. Everything we've talked about this morning you can also apply there. It's gonna take work. You're not just gonna get to walk down the road easy peasy, hand in hand, singing kumbaya. I'm sorry. It's not gonna be easy. There will be times of hardship. There are gonna be times of struggle. But if you remember the promises that are in the word that you can claim every day, you can look at the enemy when he gets in your face and you can say, I have been found.